Did you know that one basic machine laid the groundwork for all of computer programming? Stick around to find out what that machine is. Are you ready to find out what basic machine was crucial in the development of computers and computer programming as we know it today? Well, a little bit of a drum roll, please. I'm talking about the loom. This is clearly a child's toy, bright pink, purple plastic, but it will serve the purposes of talking about the basic functions of a loom, how it works, and how it led to a great idea in data storage that would be used eventually by computers. So let's take a closer look at this loom and how it works. Looms work on the basic principle of weaving. So you probably at some point in your life have done a little craft, making little pot holders where you set up ropes or strings or these rubber bands one way and then you weave the other direction going over, under, over, under, over, under. And then the next line you go under, over, under, over, under, over until you've made a woven pattern. This loom is just a more mechanized version of doing that. So in order to create those lines of strings that go across, we set up something called our warp thread. So our warp thread is what's going to be stretched across the loom. Now we have our warp threads all set up along our loom. And the next thing we have to do is what is called the weft thread or what actually gets woven through. And these get attached to a shuttle. And this is just a tool that helps you pull the yarn through without having to like have a really long tail of yarn and then pull it all through and pull all the slack along. So we have our loom with our warp thread set up and our shuttle with our weft thread set up. And so now we can start weaving. So what we're gonna do is go under, over, under, over, under, over, all the way across our loop and pull the shuttle through and not have it get stuck. And then we can come back around and do the opposite. So under, over, under, over, and so forth and so on to create our second row. And we have these handy dandy little combs that can push down our weaving. That's all fun and games, but it gets kind of annoying to try to keep track of which way you need to put the under, over, or over, under. Wouldn't it be a lot easier if there was something that could just push and pull the threads up and down for us? Well, there are. And in this case, it's this little tool here. In looms, there are different things, depending on the type of loom, that could push it in and out. So I've raised this part of the loom and you can see these little sticks poking up. And now I'm going to stick in this tool. So this tool has a series of cutouts and non-cutouts. And when I lower the loom back down, the pieces that are cut out, the little pegs are going to go through and the pieces that aren't cut out, the pegs are not gonna go through and are gonna stick up. So now instead of having all of our threads being, you know, even with one, some of them, half of them are raised and the other half are lowered, which means now it's really easy to go in, let's tighten these up a little bit, to go in and stick our shuttle between the two threads because half have been raised. And now if I wanna go ahead and do the same thing, I just hit it again and it switches which half are raised and lowered. And I can repeat this again and again to start forming a weaving. Now the little tool I have that moves my warp threads up and down so that it's easier for me to put the shuttle through is all fine and dandy if I just wanna make a simple two color or one color, just very plain weave. But what if I wanted to make something fancier, a fancy pattern cloth. And of course, people back in the 17 and 1800s, and you know, before that, because looms have been around for a long time, wanted fancy pattern cloth, especially the rich people. To make fancy pattern cloth, you actually needed two workers. You needed a skilled weaver to put the shuttle through and weave the fabric, but you needed a second person called a draw boy to 
figure out what pattern you are making and actually manually lift up the warp threads in order to form that pattern. So as you can imagine, this took two skilled people a lot of time to do all these fancy patterns by hand and people could make mistakes or they wouldn't always turn out exactly the same time after time, which made these pattern cloths very expensive. Well, along came an inventor named Joseph Marie Charles Jacquard. He's French, you can always tell the French by their names. And he came up with an idea for mass production of pattern fabrics, also known as the Jacquard loom. What he did is he started storing patterns on something called a punch card that looked like this. And this is very similar to the tool I held out earlier where there's a series of punches and holes in it and where there isn't a punch, the little pegs would stay up, thus lifting up the weft or the warp threads. And if there was a hole in it, the little pegs would go down through it, thereby lowering the warp threads. So this was a mechanical way that you could produce the pattern and actually one, get rid of the need for a skilled draw boy to mainly raise and lower the threads. Two, you don't need a skilled weaver anymore to follow the pattern. And you can get one fairly unskilled person to use a punch card to mass produce pattern fabrics, which you know greatly increased the supply of pattern fabrics and greatly drove down the cost. It also made a lot of skilled weavers and people seeking jobs in the textile industry mad, which is actually where the term Luddite came, comes from. So Luddite refers to somebody who rejects new technology. And in the 1800s, I believe, this was a group of English people who were very mad that their textile mills were being replaced by these jacquard looms and started rioting against the advent of this new technology because it would put them out of a job. So that's just a really a side fun fact about looms. But so what this punch card does is it gets fed into my loom the very same way this other tool does. So I'm gonna go ahead and take out, oh, give me a second. I'm gonna go ahead and take out this plastic piece and feed in the punch card. And each of these punch cards with this kit comes with like letters. So I'm gonna load in the B1 for Brianna because you know, why not? So now as you can see, maybe, I'm trying to get a good angle for this, there we go. I have loaded the punch card in and here's the first row right here and these are all of the pegs. So when the pegs go down, this hole, if one's on holes, the pegs are gonna go down, one's without a hole, the pegs are gonna stay up, lifting up our left threads. Now in order to load in my punch card, I had to cut out all of my yarn that was already on here. So I'm gonna go ahead and reload everything and then start explaining to you how we got from Jacquard Loom punch cards to computer programming you know, the actual science in this video. <laughs> the idea of storing information in these punch cards for the loom became actually the early foundational ideas for computer and computer technology that were port, bleh, put, put forth by Charles Babbage and Ada Byron Lovelace in the 19th century. And I wanna give you a quote here from Ada Byron Lovelace uh, where she said, quote, we may say most aptly that the analytical engine, that's what they called their kind of early computer, weaves algebraic patterns just as the Jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. So Ada Lovelace saw this connection between the Jacquard loom of its punch card storing information and the ability to use that information, effectively the first binary code, either punched or not punched, a zero or a one, to also put information to their early computer. The Jacquard loom also provided additional inspiration to an inventor at the end of the 19th century named Herman Hollerith, and he was tasked with trying to make the United States Census data compilation go a lot faster. So the data compilation for the 1880 US Census took almost eight years to compile. And Herman Hollerith created a machine that read punch cards, information punched into a card, and was able to compile the data for the 1890 US Census in just one year alone. And he formed a company called Hollerith's Tabulating Machine Company, which would go on to become IBM. And IBM still used punch cards in their computers until the 70s and 80s. So this is a technology that started in looms and moved to how we computer program today. So this is the little bee I ended up making out of my loom and I just had to use the punch card. I didn't have to think about which threads to pull up and how to weave the pattern, which I wouldn't have any idea how to do. The punch card did all of the work for me, making this 
a really useful storage information storage device. And that's what early computers were using it for, storage information. Now, again, we have all of our storage on computers and a lot in hard drives and more kind of digital aspects, but this was a physical card that you would have to carry around to use a computer code uh, to program a computer with. Actually, the longest computer code ever recorded on punch cards required 62,500 punch cards. So a giant stack of punch cards for the purpose of coding a computer. Now we can do that in like a program loaded on a hard drive. So pretty crazy that advancing technology over the past couple hundred years, all due to the basic and amazing loom that has been weaving fabric for us for probably thousands of years. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Thank you all so much for watching. Uh, stay tuned for next week for our final science field trip, summer science, whatever going on, where I will finish out at the beach just where I started a couple months ago. Like this video, subscribe to my channel, check me out on Instagram, and keep it sciencey!